Well, morning, guys. So this was me at MarchCon two years ago. And what I spoke about back then was, like Sarah was saying, link building. And this is kind of the talk that I gave back then. And it went down pretty well. I got some good feedback afterwards, got lots of good comments, and the speaker scores were pretty good. So as I was preparing for this MozCon, I figured, why well, reinvent the wheel? So people wanted those actual tips, right? They wanted the takeaways. They wanted things I could go away and do straight away. So that's what I'm going to do, 20 tips across a range of marketing areas that you guys can all go away and use, so designed for anyone to use. Uh, quick question first. Um, it's kind of tough to see, but let's give this a try. Who, who was at MozCon two years ago and saw me talk? Oh, wow, it's actually, wow. Thanks for coming back. Wow. OK, so you may remember that I talked about this stuff, and probably a little bit more than I should have done, to be honest. Um, those of you that weren't here, um, I kind of said that if you wanted more than the tips from the presentation, you could just feed me Guinness and you get tips as a result. And I made a bit of a bold claim back then that there was a direct correlation between the number of link building tips I gave away and the number of points of Guinness I consumed. Now, after careful consideration of the data after last MozCon, it's more like this. And I'm really open to the idea that, you know, get, feed me Guinness, I'll give you more tips, but try and get me before that curve goes the other way because I can't guarantee the quality or the legality of the tips that I'll give away after that point. So let's get going, straight into the tips. Start off with organic search. The first tip I'm going to give, really simple one, just go and use this tool. The guy, Gareth, that built it is sat over the back there by the doors. Um, he's taking feature requests. It's a really, really cool tool. This is what it looks like. You're pasting a list of URLs from OSC, Majestic, Ahrefs, Webmaster Tools, and you can select the, all these different data points that it will go off and grab for you. Now, this is really cool because it mashes together Majestic um, citation flow, uh, Moz metrics as well, all sorts of different things into one data set. And there's loads of really, really cool features I've not got time to talk about, but it's, it's a really cool tool. There's a free version as well. I think Gareth's going to do a discount for MozCon attendees, which I'll tweet afterwards. It's a really cool tool. The tip I want to give away in relation to it is to be actively disavowing and removing the low quality links that you find when doing link auditing. Even if you don't think you've been hit by a penguin, even if you haven't got a manual penalty, if you've got links that are clearly low quality, ones when you look at them and the, you just really know they're not good, try and remove them, try and disavow them. Now, we've learned about this at Distilled. We've got a client where we've got some pretty good links. And They've got a pretty shady past. They've done a lot of bad link building in the past. And what we're seeing is that these kind of links don't necessarily outweigh all the stuff that's been done in the past. Instead, you need to get rid of the stuff that's happened in the past for these to have the full effect. So make sure that you're re removing crap links, disavowing them, because this kind of work won't be as effective if you don't do that. Number two. When you start a project, it's really easy to dive straight in and go, hey, what new stuff can we do? What things can we create? What content can we do? But oftentimes, there's things sitting right under your nose that you can use rather than getting into new stuff. It's important to audit those. And I'm going to give a few examples. One is social, whether it's Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, Instagram. There's a bunch of social channels that you can use. Brewdog, they're a craft beer company in the UK. Now, they've got a good social following, not millions, but 50,000. That's pretty good. So for these guys, they could use a tool like FollowWonk, a great tool from Moz, that you can dive into the followers themselves and find bloggers, journalists, writers, people that have got their own websites. You can see people who have got their own social followings, the kinds of people who you want to engage with. And what you then do is take those people out, push them into a separate list, and start looking for ways to connect with those people. Because they already like your brand. They've already shown a connection. All you've got to do is reach out to them and say, OK, can we do some sort of event together? Can we do content promotion together? Can you input on our product lines? And just start building those relationships. This is another really overlooked asset, people. I'm going to give you a real example from a distilled client. We work with a hotel chain, and we did some link building training for their hotel managers uh, in London. And we kind of talked to them about link building, gave them the background, the theory, that kind of stuff gave them some ideas for what they could do to get links, and gave them an idea of what a good link was and what a bad link was. 
But we also incentivized them to do their own link building. And we gave them a really good idea of what quality looks like. And we only incentivized them and gave them prizes and bonuses if they built quality links. And this worked really well. After a few months, they built about 70 or 80 links to their domains. And they needed that incentive. They needed that help and that guidance. But once they got it, all we had to do was provide an overview you know, and kind of see what they were doing and make sure we were monitoring and giving them feedback wherever necessary. It's a great box. OK. So when I spoke to my boss, Will, at Distilled, about talking about this great box at MozCon, this is kind of the look that he gave me. On the other hand, when I spoke to Phil, um, he was like, Scrape box, yeah, OK, let's do it. So Scrape box can be a really bad tool. You can use it for all sorts of things. But there's some good ways you can use it as well. And I want to give just one of those tips away. So if you're doing keyword research for content creation, there's a feature on Scrape box that will go off and scrape Google Suggest, Amazon, Yahoo, uh, Google Product Suggest, all sorts of different sources. So you can start with a simple keyword. In this case, I want to create content around photography tips. Scrapebox then allows you to append A to Z to all those keywords. So you end up with a seed list of 27. It will then go off and scrape all those different sources and bring back a list of keywords. This only ran for about a minute, and it came back with over 1,000 results. So you can run it for longer and get more. What you then do is take the results, paste them into something like Excel, find and replace the original keyword, in this case, photography and tips. Take what's left over, paste them into a word cloud, and you'll see something like this. Now, these are the trends of what people are searching for across all those different sources. So it gives us a place to start from when it comes to, comes to content creation, but with keywords that we know people are searching for. SEMrush. It's a great tool. Again, lots of features. I'm just going to talk about one of them. When you go to the keywords report on SEMrush, there's a little button called SERP source. Now, I missed this quite, quite a lot when I, did, when I was using the tool. It kind of went straight by me. But it's really, really useful. When you click through on that to a certain keyword, you'll get a page that looks like this. Now, this is a natural snapshot of the ranking for cheap flights on, in this case, the 9th of July. So it doesn't just scrape your rankings. It scrapes the, what the actual page looked like at that top point in time. So if you're trying to debug ranking changes and see, well, what happened around this time? We've seen a drop or an increase. It's a lot easier to then go back and say, well, we can see. We can see exactly what happens. And SEMrush gives you all of that data. It's really, really cool. Another great tool. Nerdy Data, it's basically a search engine for source code. They go and in in index the web, and you can search the source code that it finds. Now, there's loads of really cool uses for this. You can search for Google Plus authorship. You can search for if someone's using your Google Analytics ID. And you can search for link uh, footprints as well if you're trying to uh, do link audits. There's one sneaky way of, doing, of using it as well, which I couldn't help but talk about. And that's this search. Because occasionally, putting this in and looking for your competitors will bring up interesting results. For example, if they're using microsites or separate domains or subdomains, and they're role clone looking back to the page that they want to rank. Interestingly, when I was doing this, most of the most interesting results came from when you put SEO companies into this, um, which I'm not going to talk about that, but go and have a play, and it's a pretty cool little thing that they do. So content creation. When you're creating content, you want to make sure you're targeting that content at the right audience. Full Contact is a tool that's been mentioned a few times the last few days. There's a way you can use Full Contact to do audience research for your content. Now, Full Contact allows you to upload a list of email addresses. So that could be your customers, a list of Twitter accounts, maybe the people that follow you, Facebook IDs, and even phone numbers. And then it will go off and try and find associated information based on what you give it. And there's loads of data points that it tries to pull back. And they make it really easy to use, because there's a spreadsheet you can go and download that does all of the hard work for you. You don't need to ha know how to code or use APIs. You just use this spreadsheet. It's really, really easy to use. Now, there's one data point that it pulls back, which I want to talk about. It tries to find someone's job title. So when the results come back and you've got a big list of job titles for your customers, you can take all of those, again, put them into a word cloud, and get something like this. So if we're putting together a piece of content, and this is what the data is showing us, we can shape that content for these kind of people. And we can also make sure we promote that content 
It's the kinds of places that these guys hang out. In this case, we might say that LinkedIn is a good target for promotion of this piece of content, given what we're seeing in the data. And when it comes to creating content, it's really important to verify your idea. Because the last thing you want to do is go through the whole process of you know, ideation, creating the content, and then you put it live, and nothing happens. It's, it's painful. We've all been there. We know what it feels like. And it's really tough. And I want to give away one of the tips we use at Distilled to try and overcome that and make it less likely. And that's to get input from not just the people who work on the, the project team, not just the creatives or the outreach team or the SEOs. We look wider within the company. So this is an email that Jess, our head of PR in London, sent to the whole company. We're looking at developing a piece of content for a client around grammar and people's pet peeves when it came to grammar. So what really annoyed them? And this is a snippet, a snippet of the email thread that came back. All in all, there was nearly 100 replies. And this was great. You know, loads of people responded, struck a chord with people. What was even better than the fact that this isn't about 90 minutes. It was a pretty, I think it's probably the most unproductive 90 minutes in Distill's history. But it was like, this struck a chord with people. And when we went through and looked at the emails themselves, people were showing emotion. They were saying, oh, I hate this, or I really can't stand it when people do this, which scared me because my grammar's terrible. I realized I work with a lot of angry people at Distilled. But this worked to verify the idea. It showed that we had something. It showed that it was worth pushing forward and worth spending time on. We all do competitor analysis. You know, it's pretty straightforward. But most of the time, we all do it for our business competitors. What we should be doing as well is competitor analysis on our content competitors. And I want to give you a real example. We work with a client in the UK who sells small business insurance. And we wanted to, to develop some content that was basically a small business guide to social media. If we just looked at their direct business competitors to see if any of them were doing that kind of content, we wouldn't have found very much, because they weren't. But when we looked a little bit wider, we found this. There's no way we'd have put Mashable in the same bucket as you know, these clients' competitors. There's no way that that would ever happen. But the reality is that if we want to develop this piece of content, this is who we're competing with. So we have to do something that is better than this, or different, or more novel, and make sure that we've got a chance of doing a better job. And you can use um, the keyword difficulty tool on Moz to do this as well. Rather than searching for you know, a business word, like uh, a commercial word like digital cameras, search for this instead. See who's ranking, see what kind of links are going to those pages, click through, and think, can I do a better job than these guys? Content calendars. Uh, sorry, event calendars. Uh, Lexi touched on this on Monday in relation to PR activity. It's a really cool idea. So content calendars, sorry, event calendars are everywhere online. You just have a quick Google, you find you know, national holidays, sports events, cultural events, all sorts of things. And what this can do is help you define a content calendar. Because when events are taking place, there's always content written about them. It could be a big national event that a, um, a magazine or a newspaper writes about, right down to a small local event that a small blogger or a local newspaper writes about. And we did this for one of our clients, and this is a piece of content around UK festivals. If we'd launched this content and tried to promote it in December, which in the UK is pretty wet, miserable, probably freezing cold and snowing, that wouldn't have done as well, because no one was writing about festival content at that time of the year, so they wouldn't have really cared. Whereas when we push it out before the summer, when festival season is starting to get some momentum, people are writing content about it anyway, this can really support their existing content and give them that extra asset to make their content better. By your best performing content, I don't mean content that gets the most links, gets the most social shares, not even the most traffic in this case. What I'm talking about is content that assists with conversions. This is from Google Analytics, so it's just a conversions report. And what you can do here is add a secondary dimension for landing page URL. And you can put your content into this filter so that you only see content that has helped with assisted conversions. A lot of content may not drive direct conversions, but this tells us when it's played a part somewhere in the process. And the result looks something like this. Sorry, I couldn't share the client URL. But this particular piece of content assisted with about 24 conversions. So from this data, we can say, OK, let's push more content at the, uh, sorry, push more traffic at this page. Let's do some more outreach, some PR. Let's do some Twitter ads, Facebook ads, LinkedIn, whatever it is, to push more content at traffic at this page. 
because we know it's going to help with conversions and not just traffic, social shares, or links. Content promotion. OK, so um, this is the only tip I'm going to ask you guys not to tweet. Um, not because it's blackout or manipulative or, well, it, it's not that man manipulative, to be honest. Um, well, no, it's not. But the, the reason I'm going to ask you guys not to tweet it is because the example I'm going to use is Autographer, and my girlfriend Ellie manages this account. And if she knew that I was about to tell 1,300 people to go and steal her hard work, um, I don't think she'd be too pleased. I think I'm pretty sure by the time I got home, my clothes would be neatly stacked outside the front door with suitcases, and I'd be sleeping on Phil's sofa for three weeks. I, mean, I like Phil, but not that much. But anyway, every Twitter account's got this. If you go to this drop down menu and click on lists, you'll see a list of lists that that Twitter account has curated. See the one at the top? 37 bloggers that have been curated and listed on Twitter. And they've all got, clearly got Twitter accounts, obviously. I can just steal these. Rather than going and starting from scratch and trying to find high authority, genuine bloggers, I can just go and steal someone else's work. And it's amazing how many Twitter accounts leave this open. You can make these private, but a lot of people don't. I don't think they realize that you can use them. There's people like me who can do this with them. Right, so Facebook ads. If you're doing outreach, you've probably got a list of email addresses. Uh, obviously, the people you're going to email to do your content promotion to. Facebook Ads has got a feature called Custom Audiences. We'll mention this uh, short, um, earlier on. One way you can define a custom audience is by uploading a data file. That data file can include email addresses. So that list of blogger emails that you've got, you can upload them to Facebook. And at the same time that you're about to do outreach, you can push that content straight into their Facebook feed to try and hit them with not just the email, but with some social promotion as well, to try and get that little bit of extra chance that they're going to notice it and hopefully start that relationship and start talking to you. You can also, using Facebook ads, target people at work publications. This was mentioned yesterday, where sometimes you want to push your content to your customers, but you also want to push your content to influencers who have got the chance to you know, help you promote it. So on Facebook, you can target by a bunch of demographics, one of which is employer. It allows you to do stuff like this. This is really broad, you know, big publications, lots of different industry areas. So you can go really broad like this or go really narrow as well based on your industry or your location. I was chatting to Zeph the other night, actually. He had a great suggestion around this, uh, which was to also target by job title, which you can put in as journalist. You can do that as well. And it gets your content in front, of the, in front of the kinds of people who can write about it and share it. OK, look at local audiences. I'm going to quickly explain what they are for those of you that aren't familiar. So you can say to Facebook, hey, here's a list of you know, people in my audience. And it could be people that have liked your Facebook page. And what Facebook then does is go through all of those people and pull out their demographics, their interests, their likes. And it mashes all of those things together and looks for more people on Facebook who share those same characteristics. And it will put all of those people into a whole new bucket of people you can target with your adverts. I'm going to quickly step through the process. It's really simple. Create a look like audience, and you select the source of the audience, you know, what you want Facebook to base the new list on. In this case, I've used a distilled Facebook page and gone through you know, the people who liked it. There's another way you can use this as well in the moment. Selected US. You can only select one location at a time right now, which is a bit annoying, but you know, it's not too bad. And you can create this audience really easily. And then when you go to create Facebook ads, that audience shows up as an option in a drop-down menu. And you can push adverts straight at this new audience, but an audience that is very similar to the people you've already got. Now, there's another way you can use this for content promotion. Because you know, I mentioned that the source in that example was a distilled Facebook page. There's another way you can define the source. And that's people who have converted. So you can create a conversion on Facebook for a view of a page. Let's say it's a piece of content we've created. So you can say to Facebook, track every time someone goes to that page and is logged into Facebook. And it will put all of those people into a list. It looks something like this. You can see the line flattens first, jumps up as soon as people start coming through to this page. And Facebook's recording all of those people. You can select from the drop-down menu on the right and say, create a lookalike audience 
based on the people that have already visited my content. It will take all those demographics, those interests, those likes, and find more people on Facebook that share those characteristics. And you can push your content towards them. It's a great way of pushing your content further to a bigger audience, but in a very, very, very targeted way. Because you're using your existing data to do so. Twitter's got a very similar feature. I'm not going to go into detail on it, but it's called Tidered Audiences. Um, it's a very similar thing. If Twitter's more of your platform, go and take a look at that, and it'll probably work for you quite well. Conversion. Phil mentioned this yesterday in terms of YouTube. So he showed you this graph. And YouTube kind of sits somewhere between brand awareness, consideration, advocacy. Content that's not product pages or category pages tends to sit in a similar kind of place. The problem is that, you know, that, that those people aren't going to convert straight away. And that's OK. You know, it's for the brand awareness or consideration. And we've actually got a client in the UK who I showed earlier, the train line. They sell train tickets. And if I click through to their content and love that content, engage with it, link to it, share it, I could do all of those things. But if I don't need a train ticket at that point in time, I'm not going to buy one, no matter how good that content is. But if I put remarketing tags on that content, they can target me further down the line. They can build up a nice list of people who have visited that content, have seen the brands, have become aware of it, and try and convert them further down the line. It's a great way of getting more from your content and make it more valuable to the business. Oops, went backwards. There's a great report in Google Analytics called Reverse Goal Path Report. And it's really, really good for finding places in your conversion process where people get distracted. So it's hidden down here on the left-hand side under conversions. And when you click through to it, you'll see something like this. Now, this is one of our clients, and we could see the steps people were taking towards conversion. There's a few URLs here that are a little bit concerning. There's delivery date, there's frequently asked questions, there's terms and conditions. Now, those are important to customers, right? They need to see the information on those pages. But the fact that they're going through the conversion funnel, then jumping out to a separate page, isn't that great, because you're trusting them to then come back in. I don't really want to do that. I want to keep them in the checkout process as much as possible and not have them be distracted. So you can use data like this to say, well, OK, let's address delivery um, concerns within the process itself and try and not make people click to a separate page. Let's see if we can do a split test and improve conversion by addressing that concern on the page itself. You can also use Google surveys to drive conversion rate tests. And Google surveys are pretty cheap. And you can ask questions such as this. And the idea being, you find why your customers might not buy your product or your service. And you can do free form answers. People just type the answers. Or you can do multiple choice. We did one with a client where it was free form. And the word cloud that Google gave us back was this. It's pretty, pretty black and white what we need to do here. It's really clear what the concerns the customers the most with buying this particular client service. So we can use this data to drive conversion rate tests and see whether we can address you know, fraud concerns and trust concerns in the checkout process and on the website to try and increase conversion. And we've got the data telling us that that's what customers you know, are con most concerned about. Uh, full disclosure, you're going to get some bad data sometimes if you do free form answers. Some of these were pretty, these were the ones I could show. Some of the ones that are in there were pretty, pretty bad. So just that's what happens sometimes, but most of the data is really, really good and really, really useful. It can use it to drive conversion. Measurement. If you're doing social campaigns with clients or your um, in-house team, you may do competitions, you may do content promotion, you could do events. There's a really cool tool you can use called tweetreach.com that allows you to track the reach of a hashtag. It gives you a bunch of stats for free. There's a paid version as well, if you want more. This is the free version. And you go further down this page, there's all sorts of stats as well around the people that share that content, uh, sorry, people that share that hashtag, people that are most active. And it's all for free. It's really, really useful for seeing the reach of your social campaigns and tracking those hashtags and measuring the value of your work. Last one. Now, I'm guessing a lot of you do link building, do outreach. If there's one tip you take away from this talk and you do outreach or link building or PR, I kind of want it to be this one. 
Now, we've all said this kind of thing to clients. And this isn't bad. We know that domain authority 85 and above is pretty strong because we understand domain authority. Four links, yeah, not that many, but they're strong. We know that. You can add more context to help people who don't understand domain authority. So pretty well-known publications, pretty well-known web websites. Most people don't understand that they want their business featured on these kind of websites. I think I prefer this one. There's no room for ambiguity when you can say this to your boss or to your client. And this is really, really easy to measure. You set up a custom segment in Google Analytics and include traffic sources for the websites that you do outreach to or PR to. And this is an example from one of our clients, uh, the outreach team, some of us over there who work in Seattle, worked on this campaign, and it showed us this. And those guys can say, hey, that orange line right there, that was us. That's a direct result of the work that we've done. And for them, it's a much smarter way and a much more effective way of measuring their work other than saying, hey, we got you some links. No matter how, many, you know, how good the domain authority is, how good the page rank is, or anything like that, this is way, way better. And there's all sorts of stats associated with this as well that you can show the client. There's a bunch of tips there. There's a quick reminder. By doing all of these, there's kind of something else going on there. We're building a better platform. We're building better content. We're building a bigger and more targeted audience. We're pushing that audience down the right conversion paths. And we're measuring it all a hell of a lot better. Platform, uh, platform audience, content, conversion, and measurement. Those five things form the basis of a framework we're using at Distilled to help create better integrated marketing campaigns because they force us to think outside of SEO. It forces us to think more than just links. And it's made us go on a bit of a journey at Distilled over the last couple of years from thinking of things as link bait, like most of us have at some point, and thinking, hey, how many links can we get? That's awesome. You know. But we've moved now to much more integrated marketing campaigns using this kind of framework where we can look at all the different areas that we can help our clients. And I've kind of done this as well. I mean, two years ago, I was giving you guys a bunch of link building tips. And yeah, links are always going to be important. I'm not going to lie about that. I think that they're always going to play a part in rankings. But there's so much more we can do, as Will was just talking about. And this is something that I've had to learn and come to realize over the last couple of years. And I want to leave you guys with a client, a client example of where we've done this and show that this kind of thing works. This is a piece of content we did for one of our clients. It shows the vocal ranges of um, the world's greatest singers. And you can see it got some pretty good traction. But the thing is, no matter how good these numbers individually are, any one or two of them isn't really going to work for the client. It's the combination of them. It's the combination of all of them that makes a difference to the client. It means that their customers are seeing people they follow on Twitter tweet their content and their brand. It means that the client is being featured really prominently on publications their audience read. And not only that, they're all coming through to the website itself, seeing the brand and becoming familiar with it. And they're all the kinds of people who could become customers of the client. To top it all off, um, this only happened, I think, two weeks ago. Uh, this guy commented on it. And I mean, we didn't aim for this at the start. It's not a metric we really think about it distilled. Is Axel Rose going to comment on it? It's not really one of our KPIs. But I was sitting next to our head of creative in London and the outreach team back there. Um, I'm guessing that their reaction was something like this when that happened, <laughs> as well as the clients. And this went, you know, the value goes way beyond just the links. And on that note, thank you. Thank you, Ben. Thank you. Uh, I love that last example. So when you go beyond link building into something more integrated marketing, magical things like Axel Rose talking to you happen. Yeah. Yeah. It's that's, pretty, it's that's pretty awesome. surreal. Um, we're, we, we're out of time for questions, but I bought a book from you last year, uh, an e-book online on link building. Yeah. Uh, it's still one of the best link building books that you can uh, 
find today, it's still available, right? Yeah. And people can get that where? Uh, Linkbuildingbook.com. Link really build. imaginative name. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Patty Mugen. Cool. Cheers, sir. All right. Cheers.